We're in a series right now called The Weight of Your Words, and I picked this series for us because, you know, I, I do believe, and I don't think you guys would argue with this, that our words are really important. I mean, we, we all, listen, I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir here. Everyone knows that if I say something bad about somebody that it impacts them, if I say something good about somebody, it impacts them. But what this series is really about is, it's, it's not so much about you telling yourself positive things so that you change your self-image or you change the way you think about yourself. We did that at the very beginning of the year. We launched a series on that. And that was about uh, the power to change, how to, how to talk to yourself and how to say things to yourself so that you can kind of encourage yourself. You can correct that negative self-talk. What this series is about, the weight of your words, is more about how you impact others with what you say and with the, with, with the things even that, that you don't say. And so We've been talking about, and last week we really focused on this, the words we say and hear, and even the words that we don't say and that we don't hear, uh, is what plays such an impact on us. So when we say and hear things from maybe that significant other, you know, I talked about last week the friend zone, you guys were completely kind of, there wasn't a lot of energy last week, so I kind of felt like that I was talking to uh, cardboard or like a rice cake. Like, there wasn't a lot coming back, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was good, but... Uh, and so I spoke about the words that we say in here, if you're in the friend zone with somebody, and, uh, you know, again, I'll take a poll, who's been in the friend zone, who knows what the friend zone is? Uh, come on, you guys be honest, you know. Every guy in this room has probably at one point in your time been in the friend zone. It's where you like a girl, you like her so much that you're willing to like be your best friend and she'll say, hey, do you want to help me run errands? And you're like, absolutely. And you know, I firmly believe that, that guys and girls cannot be friends and that if they are friends, and that, hey, this applies to you. If, if, you're in a, if you're in a friendship right now with the opposite sex, I guarantee that one of you really likes the other person or you're related. That's the only way that that works out. That's the only way that that works. And so when you find yourself in the friend zone and you hear a word like, uh, like she tells you, you know, you're just like my brother. It's like hearing that word, what, you, what, what she said and you heard crushes your world because you've now realized we are not going to be in a relationship because she sees me like a brother. And then we talked about the words that we don't say and we don't hear. And, and, I, and a lot of people identified with me as I talked about kind of being like a bit of a, an overthinker or worrier. You know, you, you, you tell your significant other, again, this is kind of just the easiest example. You know, you hang up on the phone with them. Before you hang up, you're like, hey, love you. And they're like, okay, bye. And they hang up the phone. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. They didn't say that they love me. And you spend like the next eight hours hyper analyzing everything that they've said and everything that you've done since you can remember that leads you to that moment to figure out why on earth they didn't say that they love you. So th this is really important. It's really important for us and, and it kind of helps shape this series because these words are really, really influential. In fact, any word that is spoken to us or over us or even at us and even especially about us by other people. These are the words that end up shaping our lives. They shape how we see ourselves. They shape how we uh, interact with other people. What it is that we go and, and, and speak with other people. You know, th These are the things that make us insecure. But these are your life-shaping words. And so it's, it's important that I, you know, I really feel like we all understand that words matter and that words are important. But what we need to accept is that our words are very shaping. And when you speak to somebody, over somebody, at somebody, or about somebody, you, you are creating an image of that person, either to them or to another person. So gossip would fall in this category here, you know, which is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And so I wanted to just help us, kind of in, in three weeks' time, figure out what, what are some things that we can do that we can become aware of that can help us use our words in a better way. Because I believe that if you're here right now, and you're in this church, that there's some part of you, there's something in you that's made a decision to be here. And you believe that there's something good here. And you believe that there's something good about being here. I would say that if you're here, you are mildly or largely or just a little bit set apart from the rest of the world or the world that's out there. There's something about you that's a little bit set apart. So I'm going to make the assumption that because you've set yourself apart, even if it's just a little bit, 
that you have a desire to say positive things over people, to speak uh, positive things to people, to use your words as leverage when you talk to somebody and when you talk about somebody. That, that's what I believe. And so in order to give you a, a couple things that you can do to ensure that, that, that's what we've been talking about. Last week we talked about the first one, and the first one was this, that not all of our words weigh the same. And I often don't spend time reviewing the last week's message because I talk way too much and way too long usually. But this is important to me. Not all words weigh the same. You, we need to understand that, that when we say things that, that oftentimes we will take for granted. Well, if you've ever said to yourself, okay, for example, if you've ever said, I don't understand why you got upset over that. You know, it's because you think that your words weigh the same. But to that person that you said it to, your word doesn't weigh the same. It's a lot heavier than you would think. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go on uh, our, our YouTube page and you can look at last week's message. I, I got some good feedback from that. Um, and so today we're going to talk about the second consideration. And by consideration, I mean this is something for you to think about as you're talking. As you're talking to somebody, as you're walking into a conversation or into like a, a, a social moment or a relationship, as you're hanging out with somebody, you know, after work or on the weekends. But the second consideration is this. It's that source determines weight. So what, what this means to me is that uh, the closer that you are to somebody, maybe the heavier your words are, the more significant they are, the more that those words mean. It also can mean that, hey, if the source is something really superficial, then it doesn't mean anything to you. You know, um, if you're really sensitive, as a sensitive person, like I'm, very, I'm a very sensitive person, then source for me applies to like a lot of different things. But some of you aren't very sensitive, and so the only source that really determines weight in your life is maybe one or two people. But your source, the source of where the words come from, determine the weight and significance of those words. I'm going to unpack this more and more. And so just simply put, I want you to understand that. The source is going to determine the weight of the words. Source being the person, place, or thing that it comes from. Social media, your mom, your mother-in-law. It could be family. It could be your kids. It could be whatever it is. Source determines weight. And because our source determines weight, I, there's a little bit of a, a progression of thought here. And I, I like to think this way. I like to think very linearly. And, and so this is a linear kind of way to approach this here. If source determines weight, meaning the person determines how heavy or how significant a word is, then the weight of that word determines the impact. A, a, a word spoken to somebody that doesn't mean anything doesn't really impact anybody in any way. But the weight of a word that does mean something, it impacts them in a really great way. Impact then determines outcome. How much that impacts you determines the outcome of what, that, uh, uh, of what you do. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. I didn't plan on giving you this example, but I'll give it to you. This is me being very transparent. Can I be transparent with you guys? I mean, I am anyway. I don't care what you think. So, <laughs> so, this, so I'll give you an example of this right here. Uh, a little over a year ago, I started lifting weights. I, I, I love it. I really enjoy it. I started getting stronger, and I realized that the more food I eat, the stronger I get. The, the byproduct of that is the more food you eat, also the, the fatter that you get. And so I you know, started gaining weight, and that, that's fine. Hey, me being transparent with you guys. And I had a moment. We, we were leaving a wedding. I was leaving a wedding with my wife. And a couple days before, I had this brilliant idea of, of hey, you know, I, I've got this drink that I really love to make. Some of you guys drink wine. Some of you drink beer. And you know what? That, that, that's okay. I'm not judging you for that. But I, I don't know where this came from, but I created a drink called uh, a fairy's breath. And my wife, if she could hear this, I don't know if she's listening now because we have a, a, a toddler in there that's just wrecking everything. So she's probably with him. But... Um, I had this drink called a fairy's breath. And what it is is that I would take a Sprite Zero and I would mix it with Red Bull. So I'd get a big you know, glass of ice and I'd pour a can of Sprite Zero in there and then top it off with a can of Red Bull. And Casey, I think we called it a fairy's breath because it like just chemicals. It just had this like chemical smell. Uh, but it was like a bright, wonderful smell and it made you feel like you were flying. It was great. And so I... I, you know, Red Bull gives you, gives you wings, but hey, you know, Red Bull Zero, by the way, you know, Sprite Zero, Red Bull Zero, and um, 
I, I had a, this idea that, you know what, I would just get on take a lot and I would order like a case of Red Bull. That way I don't have to go to a petrol station. Because every time I went to a petrol station, I got a candy bar. So I thought to myself, I can eliminate that and just get a case of Red Bull. Well, it just so happened I wasn't home when the case of Red Bull arrived. So I get a message from Casey. And it's, I think it was a picture. And it was this huge case of Red Bull Zero. And she's like, huh, look what showed up today. And I was like, yeah, yeah, problem solving. You know, I'm trying to be smart about that. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back for my wife. And she said... Because she's an important source to me. And her weight of her words matters to me. And the weight of what that word impacted me. And on our way home from a wedding, she said, you got to stop. I'm worried about the amount of of, uh, Red Bull and Fairy's Breath and things like that that you're consuming. And so she said, you got to stop that. And that impacted me. And because of that impact... It determined the outcome. So now I no longer drink Fairy's Breath. I've switched. I'm hopelessly uh, addicted to Coke Zero. So you guys can pray for me on that. I've switched one addiction to the other. Um, I th- you know, I th- I'm editing. I thought about you know, other things. but I, So that's an example of where that matters to me, of how that mattered. Is that her telling me, hey, genuinely, I'm a little bit concerned with the amount of that stuff. The fact that a case, I don't mean like six, I mean like 36, uh, showed up at the house. She's like, that's a bit of an issue here. We need to deal with that. And so I honored that, and it impacted kind of my outcome there. And so th- this kind of leads to the, the, the next part of this that I want to unpack. Today's going to be a lot about me unpacking some things that when, when I started to study this, I thought, man, this kind of like changes everything for me. It it changes the way that I look at kind of everything that I say to other people. So I want you to receive this. You know, it's a simple message. I've got one scripture for us. And we talked about it last week. And the rest of it is me kind of unpacking this thing. And it's going to set us up for the end of this message. You're going to see why we spent so much time uh, setting this up and unpacking this idea. But I want to talk with you about relationships. Because when source determines weight... It oftentimes comes from some type of relationship that you have with that source. Here's a truth that we don't think about, but we need to accept. And it's this. The relationship that you have with others is not the same relationship that they have with you. Now, I don't know if that immediately makes sense to you. So I worded it a little bit differently, a little bit easier for it here. And it says that this right here, you're in a relationship with someone. You are in a relationship with someone. Don't overcomplicate that. You're in a relationship with somebody. They do not have the same relationship with you that you have with them. Those two relationships are oftentimes not equal. Let me give you some examples. Teacher and a student. A teacher has a relationship with a student. That relationship revolves around certain things. It's a a position of authority or it's a position of respectful way, but a teacher has a relationship with a student. A student has a relationship with a teacher, but that's a very different relationship. They they, they call them ma'am. They call them sir. They know that they're supposed to hand in their homework. They oftentimes don't have a very personal relationship with them. Another example of this is parent and child when I was studying this, this one, ooh, this one got me really hardcore. That as, a, as a parent, my relationship with my children is to help them to grow, help them become healthy men, help them to become good leaders, help them to know who, they're, who they are, who their identity is in Christ. I'm also the one that walks around the house and says, hey, pick up your toys, and kind of yells at the kids for doing stupid stuff and that sort of thing. But the relationship that my child has with me is very simple. I am their one source, and Casey as well. We are their one source of approval. We're their one source of love. We're their most important source of, am I okay? Am I enough? See, we take for granted, I take it for granted. Like, of course, you're my son. I love you unconditionally. I love you no matter what. You know, yesterday, and again, I'll use a personal example. We're teaching Benjamin how to eat cereal. And so, I mean, just cereal, milk and cereal. And so we're teaching him, you got to sit on your bottom at the table. You've got to use two hands. He's got this bowl, an open bowl of milk and cereal there. We're trying to tell him how not to spill it. A couple minutes go by, and he just knocks the whole bowl over, and he spills it because he got distracted, and he just 
knocked it over. And I kind of come around the corner. I, well, first I hear Casey go like, Benjamin, you know. And so I come around the corner, and I'm like, Benjamin, you got to sit down on your bottom when you eat. And I looked at him, and, and normally he's like, whatever, you know, I do what I want. But this time he looked at me, and he had this look in his eyes of like, of, oh, my goodness, you don't approve. I did something that, did, that, that made you unapprove of me. And, and I, I felt really sensitive at that moment, and I, I bent down, and I just said, hey, listen, you know what? It doesn't matter. It's fine. And I gave him a big hug, and I said, listen, I love you so much. You're so great. You're learning. You're practicing. Uh, listen, I, you're wonderful, okay? Like you, we're we're going to learn to eat cereal together. We'll try again later. And it changed his whole disposition. I thought, man, as a parent, I need to make sure that I do more and more and more of that. And you, and you probably do as well. Another relationship example is boss and employee. This is almost self-explanatory. Your boss has a different relationship with you than you do with him or with her. They can just tell you what to do, whereas you cannot just tell them what to do. Your boss can oftentimes get away with things that you can't get away with, depending on if you have a good boss or if you have a bad boss. But that relationship, there are certain lines that many of us wouldn't cross with our boss, or we wait on the boss to establish what is like an appropriate relationship to have. How close are you? Are you really good friends? Are you not friends? They kind of determine that there. And and then the most important one for us is is this, this example here. It's the relationship between you and them. And this counts for everybody. The, the, see, I, what I want you to understand is that, yes, there's those examples, student, teacher, parent, uh, child, boss, employee. But the other example, the one that's most applicable to all of us, is that there is you and then there is them. Meaning, like I said before, everyone in here is in a relationship with somebody else. And that relationship is oftentimes not the same that you have with them and they have with you. So I hope that you understand that. Because that's kind of the, the big concept that we're looking at here. Is that you're, and I know I just keep saying it over and over and over again. And I think part of that is because while I was studying this, I just kept thinking it over and over and over again. And I thought of all these examples in my life of where I had a relationship. I have relationships with people and, and they don't have the same relationship with me. And I examined in myself, I examined in my wife. You know, I have a relationship with Casey, but she sees our relationship differently from her perspective. And, and, and that's okay. I started examining the staff that work here at the church and realized, man, we have different relationships there. Now, I started to examine, you know, like my relationship with my kids. I felt so bad about like Benjamin and the cereal. You know, I, I looked at different relationships I have with friends, thought about relationships with you guys, you know, with the church, with work. And I just started to, to, to even make a list where do I, where is, what kind of relationship do I think I have with them? And maybe what kind of relationship do they have with me? And that's different. Now the things that determine those differences in that relationship is, is this. The first truth is that we all have equal value. You know, I, I think it doesn't, you know, whether it's, a, it's America, whether it's South Africa, no matter where it is in the world... So much of society and culture tries to tell us that yeah, we're all the same, but we're not all equal. We don't have the same value, but we all have equal value. And that's something important that you understand that as those relationships are different, you know, I see my relationship as a boss with my employees in one way, and they see their relationship with me in another way, but that does not mean that our value is different. My value with Trudy, who runs Family Ministries, with Linton, who's sort of my, my, my lead executive guy that helps me do everything, and, and with Kyle, who, who assists us in all of those things, and even with some of you volunteers that take on such big and important roles here at church, you know, I am not greater than you. I don't hold more value than you do as a person. And see, I, I can say that because Jesus created us. God created us all in His image. We were all equally made. We're all equally sinners. And if we accept Christ and we become Christ followers, we're all equally followers of Christ. We're all equally sons and daughters in the eyes of Jesus. We're all equally forgiven. So if you're in a relationship that you don't see that you have equal value, 
then that, that's maybe an issue. We may need to help you with that. Or you may need to reach out to somebody and get help with that. So you may have equal value with everybody. But there's the second part of this is, is, is that all relationships, they do contain unequal power, unequal influence, and unequal authority. So every relationship that you have can be summed up, those differences in that relationship can be summed up in those three things there. There is a, a power imbalance. There's an authority imbalance. There's an influence imbalance. And that imbalance isn't necessarily bad. You kind of need that. See, as a boss, having a relationship with my employees, I kind of need their relationship with me to be a little bit different. Because I've been given by you who voted me into this position, by the church that, that hired me to do this, by people that, that look to me to run and manage and kind of lead the direction of the church, I've been given more power. I've been given more influence. And I've been given more authority. That, that's not necessarily bad. But it can be bad. It can be manipulated. And it can be used in a negative way. So listen, guys. When you look at the relationships that you have, think about one. Think about one relationship. You know, I, right now I'm thinking about my relationship with my wife. And if I think about my relationship with Casey, how I see her, how I interact with her, what I think about her, and then what, what's her relationship with me? And I, I kind of run this filter and I think, do we have unequal power in our relationship? You know, the answer to that is absolutely yes. There's some areas where Casey has more power. There's some areas where maybe I have more power. And by that, I don't mean power like power to suppress. I don't mean power, um, you know, like in, in that kind of way. What I mean, like in Casey and I, is maybe the power to lead our family as the head of the family. You know, but with, with, with Casey, you know, she has a lot of, uh, a lot more power than I do over, you know, a lot of like the, da if, if the daily life. If one of you wants to get together with me, I say, hey, you need to talk to my wife. Because I honor her, the way that she runs our schedule, the way she runs our family, the way that she handles the kids and their schedules. And so I, I completely give her way more power, influence, and authority over that there. So think about it. I, see, and before we go on here in this message, I would love, and maybe you don't know how to do this, but I would love for you to just pull into your mind a relationship that you have where your relationship with somebody is different from their relationship with you. As we, as we continue to kind of unpack this thing here. And the reason that it's different is not that you're not valuable. It's that there is an unequal power, influence, and authority. Now, Paul talks about this. This is where we introduce the scripture here. and We, we can look at Ephesians 5, 1, 1 and 2. And, and Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus. And he's kind of explaining this concept to them. He's explaining the concept of, of words and the weight of your words and how we use our words. And he explains this idea of, of power, unequal power, unequal authority, and those types of things. But it, it's, it's, you got to kind of look for it here. And so Paul says in Ephesians 5, 1, 2, 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, become imitators of God. And, and for those of you that are new here, I love teaching out of the Amplified Bible because it takes, it, it's, it's a literal translation, but it, but it expands on what some of these words mean. And so when Paul says, become imitators of God, Paul is saying, copy him and follow his example. And he's saying, do it as if you're a well-loved child, a well-beloved child, meaning God beloveds you. That's not really a word, but it means that God cares about you. He, he sees you as important. He sees you as valuable. So we are all important and valuable children to God. So... Paul says, copy him and follow his example and imitate the Father. And what, what Paul is telling us there is he, he, he's saying that Jesus is our example. And that God is our example in all things. And in all things, if you say that you're a Christ follower, then you would pursue copying God. You would pursue copying Jesus. And in fact, it should be really easy to do that. You just look in the Gospels. You look at the way that Jesus led his life. And that can show you how you are to lead your life. 
Now the second part of this verse here in verse 2, and this is the one that I really love here. It says, walk continually in love. Walk continually in love. That's having a posture of love. That's letting love kind of ooze out of you. You know, on, on Thursday, was it Thursday that we had all the traffic? Where it, it took two hours for me to get from uh, Pinelands to Rondebosch and back because of the taxi strikes. And was anyone on the road Thursday afternoon for like, you know, eight hours? Yeah, I mean, just to get out of Pinelands was crazy. Here's a question for you. How many of you then were walking continually in love in that moment? None of us. Uh, none of us were. Walk continually in love. And he, he goes on to explain. That is... We are to value one another. We're to practice empathy, compassion, unselfishly seeking the best for others. That's what it means to walk continually in love. And he's saying, you're going to do that just as Christ loved you and gave himself up for us. So that's what Paul is calling us to do there, to walk continually in love. So what that means for, for us is that we have this responsibility, and especially if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, and, and when I make, I kind of make a difference between Christian and Christ follower. Christian is oftentimes the title that we take on, meaning we've given our life to Jesus, we've been baptized, we've done all of those things, but a Christ follower is somebody that is saying, I'm aligning my life with Christ. I'm following his ways, I'm following his teachings, and guess what? If you're in here and you are a Christ follower, you do not have the option on whether or not to walk in love. You don't have the, the option. Kyle, go back a couple here. Bring up uh, 5 verse 1 for us here on the screen. You don't have the option to be an imitator of God. You're called to do that. You're asked to do that. And, and as we become imitators of God, guess what that does? That impacts the way that we talk to each other and the way that we hold relationships with each other. It, it impacts the way, that we, uh, the way that we build each other up, the way we talk to somebody, at somebody, about somebody, over somebody. See, it's really hard to gossip when you're trying to be an imitator of God and imitate His heart. It's really hard to do that. And if you find it easy to gossip around the water cooler at work or, or to spread drama, I mean, we, I love drama more than anything I do. I absolutely love it. When Casey and I were dating, she lived in this house. It was on a, a missions base. And this house looked down on a house that a whole bunch of interns lived in. And we would sit out on the back deck and have dinner together every night. And it was me and it was Casey and it was, it was Lifa. We'd sit there and we would eat. And one of my favorite things to do is just sit there and spy on the house below us there. So there's all kinds of drama that happened down there. You know, who's coming? Who's going? You know, what are they, what are they doing? You know, I just, I love drama. But you know what? The more that I try and imitate God, the harder it is for me to entertain the idea of drama. Now when people come to me with drama, I'm like, hey, you know what? I don't want anything to do with that. You know, a, a, a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago, there was a video that started circulating uh, about Andy Stanley. And, and he said some stuff in a sermon where he was talking about uh, homosexuality and, and transgender and stuff. And he was talking about how the church should be a place that's accepting for them. And, and, and that got kind of blown out of proportion. And there was, a, I think, a, almost a two-hour video put on YouTube, you know, just tearing him down for that stuff. And people would come to me and say, hey, have you seen that video? And what do you think about that video? And I would say, you know what, I haven't seen that video. I don't really care about that video. And I would say, how long was that video? And they'd tell me, I don't know, like, you know, an hour and a half, two hours. And I'd say, great. You spent an hour and a half, two hours watching that video. As a Christ follower, as somebody that loves the church and feels so passionately about the church, will you go spend two hours praying for Andy Stanley? Guess who comes to me now and tries to talk to me about drama? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Because here's the thing, that as I imitate God... I want the best for people. I want the church to win. I want Andy Stanley to win. I want you guys to win. I want Hillsong to win. I want the church down the road to win. Because I'm trying to imitate God and follow on His example. And there was nowhere in the Bible that Jesus tried to tear down people. You know, Jesus corrected people that were getting the gospel message wrong, but he didn't tear them down. The whole reason that Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament is because he wants the churches 
to have a win for the benefit of people. So we have an opportunity in our relationships. The fact that we are given an imbalance in those relationships. We have this great, incredible opportunity to leverage our authority, our influence, and our power for good and for the better, to make sure that people are winning, to make sure that we're spreading prayer rather than dissension and rather than lies, to make sure that we're standing up for truth rather than letting negativity and and, and kind of false rumors spread. That's one of the worst things about the church. The church is one of the worst platforms for loving people. And that's so, that's a shame. And I do not believe that this church represents that. And I believe that this church can play a role in leading more and more people to use their influence and their weight for the better. So I want to talk with you about responsibility. I've said we have a responsibility for this. I've got a couple responsibilities for us. And, and, and then we're going to close this sermon out. See, we we have a responsibility relationally. I want you to start taking responsibility in your relationships. And I'll just address, if you're not a Christ follower in this room, if if, if you've not given your life to Jesus, hey, welcome. Glad you're here. I don't care if you're homosexual. I don't care if you're transgender. I don't care if you identify as a grapefruit. If you could be anywhere in the world on a Sunday morning, why would I not want you to be here? And as you are here right now, and as you're sitting here listening to us talk, no matter what sin you're caught up in, no matter how much pornography you look at, no matter what you're addicted to, no matter where you find yourself in life, this is a safe space for you because I want you to win and that we have a responsibility relationally with you to make sure that we leverage our relationship with you in a way that builds you up, that encourages you, and that takes care of you. So if you're not a Christ follower and you're in here in this room this morning, you can know that this is the safest place for you to be on a Sunday morning. And maybe this becomes the safest place for you to be all week, your entire week. Because we are not called to judge and to condemn. We're called to point people to Jesus. We're called to spread the gospel message. We're called to lead people and to love people in the way that Christ loved us. And I could show you example after example after example of Christ walking up to a sinner that no one else wanted anything to do with, prostitutes, alcoholics, people that that were were stealing money, even stealing money from the temple. And he poured love onto them, and he changed them, and he forgave them, even some of them that didn't even ask for it. He said, I forgive you of your sins. That's our responsibility. You have a responsibility relationally within your house, within your family. Hey, dads, moms, parents guardians, aunts, uncles, grandmas that are raising kids, you have a responsibility to look at your relationship with those kids that grow up and that live in your house and say, how am I leveraging my responsibility with them, my relationship, my power, my authority, and my influence so that they grow up to be well-mannered, so they grow up to be uh, confident in who they are, so that they grow up to, to know God's Word, so that they grow up to be secure in their identity, to be secure in their family with you, you don't have the right to belittle them or diminish them. You don't have the right to build so much sarcasm into your relationship with them. Take responsibility. Take responsibility to be present. Take responsibility to to show extra love. Take responsibility to speak ten positive things over them for every maybe negative thing that you say. And not only do we have a responsibility relationally, we also have a a responsibility positionally. This applies to all of my bosses, all of my employees. This applies to to all of our workers of any kind. But it, it extends outside of work. What position do you hold in your community? What position do you hold on city council, on the, the, on the, the, the rates committee? What position do you hold uh, of authority on your street or on your road or uh, in, in whatever organization that it is or wherever it is that you work? Take responsibility. And you know what? This is what I love to say here is that, that if you work for somebody and they're a horrible, horrible boss, guess what? You do not get a pass. Instead, we get an opportunity to leverage the fact that we hold, we do hold a relationship with that person. 
And we may not have all the authority, we may not have all the influence, we may not have all the power in that relationship, but what we can do is we can love that person, submit to that person, honor that person, we can work our behinds off for that person, we can be the absolute best employee that they've ever seen. And it doesn't matter if you're recognized for it or not, because you are imitating God. And God doesn't put conditions on honor or servanthood. God says, just do it because you love them and because I have modeled for you what love is. Now, I'm not asking anyone to stay in an abusive relationship. That's completely separate. But what I am asking you to do is to say, hey, you take extreme ownership and extreme accountability for your responsibility within a relationship, regardless of what end of that relationship that you're on. And now the, the, the last one I want to talk about here is, is that we have a responsibility socially and culturally. And th- this is something that added in at the end because of the, the taxi strike that's going on. Because of what I saw in, in Brackenfell with the EFF and, and, and the police there. Because of the things that I hear about people you know, complaining about how our society is, is falling apart and, and kind of degradating and cracking Because of of, of all those things, what I need us to understand is that, hey, the relationship that you have with your culture and your society is very different maybe from the relationship that it has with you. The relationship that you as a white person have with a person of color or a black person is very different from the relationship that a person of color or a black person has with you. That's why it's easy for so many white people to stand up and to say, hey, I'm not racist, I don't even see color. And if that's you, then fantastic. I believe that you authentically mean that but you need to also understand that the person of color on the other side of that is allowed to say no I don't believe that I don't understand that you haven't earned that right with me and 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 that's okay for them to say that it's okay for for a whole section of the country that for the the taxi associations you know and they, they feel completely entitled to do what they do to drive on the wrong side of the road entitled to uh, not have you know registered number plates They feel entitled to do all of those things. You know, I don't care about their entitlement. What I care about is whether or not they know Jesus. What I care about is whether or not someone has listened to them. And I'm not advocating for corruption. I'm not advocating for bad things. I'm not advocating that anyone should feel guilty about your position, especially your relationship within each other and in race and in culture. And it's not just a South Africa thing. America is an absolute mess right now over this stuff. And in fact, largely, all over the world, they struggle with these things. But hey, we have an opportunity here to be a catalyst in this church. You know what people say when they come visit South Point? They say, I think this is the most diverse church in Cape Town. And when I look around, I see people loving each other no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, no matter what their background is, whether it's race, whether it's class, regardless of what it is. And, and as I was watching these taxi things happen, and as I was sitting in traffic on Thursday, actually thinking about this, I thought to myself, man, th- there is a huge disconnect. But what is it that we can do and that we can stop doing to leverage our relationship with people, to leverage our power, our authority, to leverage the influence that we have to heal first each other and then to heal a lot of this country? You know, you, we, we, this, this is so you know, heavy on my heart and so, so deep on my heart because I, I just, listen, I'm not for any, I'm not for the ANC to just be destroyed and devastated and yeah, they got exactly what they wanted. I'm not for the EFF to, you know, get sprayed down with water hoses. I'm not for the DA. I don't, actually, I don't know a ton about the DA, but I'm not like, yeah, the DA is the best. Look at the Western Cape. We have a garbage service and they don't have that in Pumalunga and you know, yada, yada, yada. I don't celebrate where we win and other people fail. Instead, I, I think to myself, what are we missing here as people? And I think what we're missing is the reality that, hey, we have a different relationship. We have different authority, power, and influence. And, and the, the last thing I want to say about this is, is this. Is that a, a lot of you, a lot of us... In, in my mind, okay, I would say that I don't have a different power, authority, or influence over somebody else. But, uh, let me use an example here. I'm going to use my, my brother Tim here down in the front here. 
I, I'm not going to say that because he's younger than me, I have a different you know, power, authority, or influence you know, over him, or because he comes from a different culture, he comes from a different race, or wh whatever it is. But you know what I need to recognize and consider? Is that he may have assigned a different power, authority, and influence to me. Meaning, I, I, I could say, I don't understand you know, why you took this wrong. I don't understand why you're offended here. I don't understand why you don't understand. kind of Because I, I, I think our relationship is this way. But if I took a second to pause and put myself in his shoes, then I may recognize, like, oh, he, he's actually assigned something to me. And I need to become aware of that. And, and, and this is another thing I would ask you guys is, what, what power, authority, influence has been assigned to you? See, I found it really hard to become a pastor at, at the beginning. Because when I told somebody that I was a pastor, I automatically became their definition or their experience of what a pastor was. I didn't get the opportunity to say, I'm a pastor, I love you, I love Jesus, all I care about is that people come to Jesus. I didn't get that chance with a lot of people. Instead, I was just assigned. This is who you are, what you are. This is the power I know that you, that you hold. This is the authority I know that you abuse. This is the influence that I know that you use to manipulate. And when I understood that and I started to accept and see that other people assigned different things to me, then I was able to then work within that and use my ability to leverage the way that God made relationships work, to help lead them into what a kind of a healthy relationship with a pastor is, for example. And so, this is the last thing I want you to think about here. Take this all the way back to God. We need to accept that God took responsibility for you. God took responsibility for me. Because who has the greatest disparity of power, authority, and influence? It's God and us. God has all the power, all the authority, and all the influence over everything that's been created, good, bad, ugly, significant, insignificant. This carpet, the rock outside, doesn't matter. God has power, influence, and authority over all of it. You have power, influence, and authority over absolutely nothing in your life when it, when it comes to God. But yet, what did God do by taking responsibility for you? He leveraged his relationship with you. And he did that by sending his son to die for you. He did that so that you could give your life to Jesus and you could be completely forgiven from every sin that you've ever committed. You could be completely just wiped clean, white as snow. You didn't need the temple anymore. You didn't need sacrifice anymore. All you needed was a quiet moment with your Lord Jesus who loved you so much that he came, he walked on earth for us, he died for our sins so that we could have a relationship with God and be restored to him. God had every right to just wipe the world completely out and clean. But he didn't. Instead, he sent his son to die for us. So if we are to follow the model of Christ, then what is it that we're supposed to do? We are supposed to leverage our relationship because source carries weight. We're to leverage that relationship for healing and for good. We're to recognize that we get assigned relational values, authority, power, influence. See what that is that someone has assigned to us and then work on healing that and work on mending that. We're not going to divide. We're not going to celebrate failure. We're not going to look for people to get what they deserve. Instead, we're going to build compassion. We're going to build empathy, just as Paul talked about. And we're going to build a true desire for people because they matter. And because God saved us before any of you did anything to deserve it, and you'll never deserve it. God forgave you just where you are, just the way you are. So I'm going to close this out in prayer. I hope that gives you something to think about. I hope some of that penetrates your heart. So Heavenly Father, we just, um, we just come before you and we pray over the words that we say. We pray over our responsibilities. Lord, everyone out here has just has been given responsibilities. Everyone out here is a source. And every source has the ability to uplift and has the ability to tear down. Every source has the ability to forgive. Every source has the ability to have compassion. Every source has the ability to speak life. So Heavenly Father, I pray that every person in this room 
is given, in their thoughts, in their spirit, in their minds, they're given a relationship that they can focus on. They can see how the dynamics are different. And they can leverage the power, the authority, the influence that you've given for the better. We thank you, Father, for modeling that for us, for sending your Son to die for us, for sending your Son to forgive us even before we deserved it. Lord, you modeled how to use your relationship with us in such an amazing way that, that we benefit. So we praise you, Father. And we thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.